July 1968. The band The Yardbirds called it quits, but still was committed to play some shows in Scandinavia, and lead guitarist Jimmy Page and bassist Chris Drea decided to play them anyway. But they, um... Needed a new lead singer and a new drummer. Page's number one choice for singer was Terry Reed, but he turned down the offer, instead suggesting Robert Plant, who had been the singer for Band of Joy. Band of Joy had broken up a couple months prior. Plant accepted the position and recommended John Bonham, who had been the drummer for Band of Joy, to join the band as well. Page was like, heck yeah, but then Drea dropped out of the band to become a photographer, so they now needed a new bass. Fortunately for Page, his old friend John Richard Baldwin, better known by his stage name of John Paul Jones, won it in, and Page gladly welcomed him. He could also play keys, so that was a bonus. The four played together for the first time in a basement below a record store on Jared Street in London. For the Scandinavian tour, they decided to change the band name to the, wait for it, the New Yardbirds! They played their first show at Glad's Axe Teen Clubs in Glad's Axe, Denmark on September 7th, 1968. The chemistry between the four was pretty amazing early on. So good that just a few weeks later, they were already recording their first album at Olympic Studios based on some new songs they had been playing live. Apparently, they recorded it in less than 30 hours and Paige paid for the entire session out of his own pocket. However, once Drea found out, he issued a cease and desist letter saying Page wasn't allowed to use the new Yardbirds moniker for the album, only for the tour. That's okay because Page had a backup name in mind for the band Lead Balloon. Eh? Eh? Okay. After further discussion with the band and their new manager, Peter Grant, that name became arguably one of the best band names ever, Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin played their first gig with the new name at the University of Surrey in Battersea on October 25th. Now, Peter Grant, who was quite an intimidating presence and later became known for helping improve pay and conditions for all musicians who often got screwed over by promoters and record companies, got the band a $143,000 advance contract from Atlantic Records in November. That's $1.1 million in today's money, and at the time was the biggest deal of its kind for a brand new band. But don't just give credit to Peter Grant. Give credit also to the British singer Dusty Springfield, a friend of John Paul Jones. In fact, she was so persuasive to Atlantic Records executives about how great Led Zeppelin was that they apparently signed them without ever seeing them live. Not only that, Atlantic let the band have full autonomy on almost everything. When they would release albums, when they would go on tour, how their albums would look, how their albums would be promoted, and whether or not they would ever release singles. Spoiler alert, they rarely released singles. The band also created their own company, Super Hype, to handle publishing rights. After touring the United Kingdom, their new tour manager, manager, Richard Cole, set up their first North American tour. While on that tour, Atlantic released their self-titled debut album. First released on January 12, 1969, it demonstrated the band's fusion of blues and rock and something else entirely. A new genre, something later just simply referred to as, quote, hard rock. The iconic artwork featured an image of the burning Hindenburg airship of the Hindenburg disaster, first photographed by Sam Shear on May 6, 1937. The album was an immediate commercial hit, but got poor reviews at first. Rolling Stone magazine, in particular, ripped it. Because of the negative attention from the press at first, the band generally avoided talking to the press again throughout their career. I think music critics didn't know how to respond to it, honestly. Guess you guys aren't ready for that yet. 
but your kids are gonna love it. In fact, Rolling Stone later praised the album. The band did release a single off it, Good Times, Bad Times, which was also the opening track. Other standout tracks that ended up on the radio anyway were Dazed and Confused and Communication Breakdown. Their self-titled debut is now considered one of the greatest albums of all time. Led Zeppelin spent the majority of 1969 touring relentlessly to promote the album. That year, they completed four UK tours and four American tours. They generally avoided television appearances, preferring their fans see them live instead. Meanwhile, they found time to already record their second studio album in between shows at several different recording studios. Just like their debut album, Jimmy Page produced it, but this time, Eddie Kramer came in to help. These songs were even heavier and just different than anything else currently in the mainstream. They wrapped up recording in August and Atlantic first released the album called simply Led Zeppelin 2 on October 22nd, 1969. Rock radio stations played the heck out of Whole Lot of Love, but it was five and a half minutes long, so pop stations avoided playing it. Atlantic was like, guys, let's edit this sucker down so pop stations will play it. The band was like, nah. But eventually they gave in and Atlantic edited it down to four minutes and it became a huge hit after that, reaching number four on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and reaching the top 10 on several other music charts around the world. But yeah, Led Zeppelin 2 was a commercial success, but got mixed reviews by music critics. But your kids are gonna love it. Some later even called it the first popular, quote, heavy metal album. Other standout songs on it included What Is and What Should Never Be, Ramble On, The Lemon Song, and Heartbreaker. By the beginning of 1970, Led Zeppelin was no longer playing clubs and ballrooms. They were playing in huge auditoriums. Some of these early shows lasted more than four hours, and the band rarely played songs the exact same way. Offstage, the band's behavior became crazier and crazier. They were certainly known to party hard, and that old sex drugs and rock and roll trope applied to them. Alcohol was the main drug, but the band later on also consumed heroin and cocaine. In May and June 1970, Page and Plant took a retreat to write a bunch of new songs at a remote cottage in Wales called, well, I'm not going to even try to pronounce that. Anyway, these songs were more acoustic based, influenced by both folk and Celtic music. They recorded at various studios throughout the year. Much of these songs ended up on their third studio album called simply Led Zeppelin 3. Hey, notice a pattern here? First released by Atlantic on October 5th, 1970. Fans were generally extremely excited for its release, but surprised to hear the different direction the band went in. While the biggest hit off of it, Immigrant Song, was definitely hard rock and similar to most of the stuff on the first two albums, most of the rest of Led Zeppelin 3 was much much more chill, and critics generally were more welcoming of the change. By the way, the B-side of Immigrant Song, Hey Hey What Can I Do, ended up becoming a pretty big hit later on as well. The band didn't tour as much to promote Led Zeppelin 3, and ended up turning down a lot of big opportunities, retreating once again to, um, yeah, that place to write more songs. Meanwhile, Led Zeppelin was becoming not only the most popular, but the most influential band in the world. And they were about to become even bigger after the release of their fourth studio album, which never officially had a title, by the way. They recorded it from December 1970 to February 1971 at Basing Street Studios in London, but mostly at a country house in Hampshire, England, using the famous Rolling Stone mobile studio. After noticing a dog that hung around the country house, Paige and Jones named a new song they wrote, Black Dog. They also recorded a little song called Stairway to Heaven. Okay, well, not so little. Clocking in at just over eight minutes, the song eventually became one of the most popular and iconic rock songs of all time. For this album, guest musicians like Ian Stewart came out to help record. Atlantic released the untitled album on November 8th, 1971. Based on what their first three albums were called, fans ended up calling it Led Zeppelin IV. It was an absolute smash success. 
This time, even critics loved it. Eventually, it became the band's best-selling album, with an estimated more than 37 million copies shipped worldwide. Radio stations played the heck out of Stairway to Heaven. In fact, even though the band never released it as a single, it eventually became the most requested song on FM radio stations in the United States in the 1970s. The band did release two singles from Led Zeppelin IV, the aforementioned Black Dog and Rock and Roll. Other notable songs from the album include Misty Mountain Hop and When the Levee Breaks. Well shoot, that's most of the album. It was basically a greatest hits album, okay? In 1972, the band once again hit the road, now as the biggest band in the world, and playing stadiums and sports arenas. They returned to Japan after touring there the previous year. They also toured Australia and New Zealand for the first time. This was when their tales of rock star excess became infamous, whether they were true or not. You know, tales like John Bonham riding his Harley Davidson down the halls of a fancy hotel. Meanwhile, the band recorded new songs at various studios, including one at Mick Jagger's house that ultimately made up their fifth studio album, Houses of the Holy, released by Atlantic on March 28, 1973. Although it received mixed reviews from critics, the album was another commercial hit, eventually selling millions and reaching the top of the charts. It featured the hits Over the Hills and Far Away, The Ocean, Dancing Days, and Dire Maker. With Houses of the Holy, the band had continued to experiment and expand their style, even dabbling in funk and reggae influences, for crying out loud. After its release, the band shattered box office records previously held by the Beatles, playing huge tours once again throughout Europe and North America. They played to 56,800 at Tampa Stadium in Tampa, Florida. They played three sold-out shows at Madison Square Garden in New York City, and all three were filmed for a future motion picture. More on that later. A major bummer during it, though, was right before the final night's performance, more than $1 million adjusted for inflation was stolen from the band's safe deposit box at the Drake Hotel. The money was never recovered, and obviously, it made Peter Grant very, very angry. The money is reportedly the largest amount ever taken from a hotel safe deposit box in New York City. Oh, I forgot to mention that they toured that year in a giant plane. Yep, a former Boeing 720 passenger jet called the Starship. In the fall of 1973, the band took a bit of a break before heading back to the studio. However, there were many delays. First, John Paul Jones wanted to quit the band, but Peter Grant talked him into staying. Really, Jones and the rest of the band just needed time off. While most of 1974 was quiet for the band, they did create their own record label that year called Swan Song Records. Atlantic Records, however, negotiated to still distribute their stuff. The first album to be released by Swan Song was their sixth studio album, Physical Graffiti, released on February 24th, 1975. It was actually a double album, featuring not only songs recorded in 1974, but songs recorded in previous years, going back all the way to 1970. It was probably their most diverse first album yet, and was another commercial success, eventually selling more than 16 million copies, their second biggest selling album ever, and debuted at number one on the UK album charts. Critics also generally loved it. Plant later expressed that physical graffiti represented Led Zeppelin at its creative peak. That said, you won't hear most of these songs on classic rock radio stations today. The biggest hit was probably Cashmere, but even that song became bigger much later later on. Basically, Physical Graffiti didn't need to be a radio-friendly album. Everyone loved it anyway, and it caused the rest of the band's discography to re-enter the charts, by the way. They returned to the Starship for another major North American tour. In May, the band played five sold-out shows at London's Earl's Court Arena, which at the time was the largest arena in Britain. In the fall, they planned on touring again, but had to cancel after Plant and his wife, Marine, 
Queen got in a major car crash while vacationing in Greece. If it weren't for a blood transfusion, Maureen would have died. Plant got a broken ankle and was unable to perform. Since they couldn't tour, they decided to write some new songs in the final months of 1975 while Plant's recovered. In just 18 days in November, they recorded some new material with Plant singing his vocals in a wheelchair. Unlike previous albums, all but one of the songs on this new album were only credited to Plants and Page, not the entire band. Swan Song released their seventh studio album, Presence, on March 31st, 1976. Most music critics these days say it's the band's weakest album, but it still received solid reviews at the time. It definitely still demonstrated that the band wasn't done experimenting, as seen with the single Candy Store Rock, which one music critic described as a mix of Buddy Holly and David Bowie, and I think that's a perfect way to describe it. While Presence did debut at number one on both the American and UK album charts, sales had gone significantly down compared to their previous few releases. This may have been since they didn't tour to support the album. Instead, the band took all that footage from the 1973 Madison Square Garden shows and turned it into a movie called The Song Remains the Same. I highly recommend it for a glimpse into not only the band at its creative peak and popularity peak, but a glimpse into what life was like for them behind the scenes at the time. Warner Brothers released it on October 20th, 1976, and it ended up making $12 million at the box office. Swan Song also released a live soundtrack album to complement the movie. It hit the top of the music charts as well. In the spring of 1977, Led Zeppelin finally was able to go back on tour. However, they didn't tour in their home country to avoid paying taxes. In the United States, though, they continued to break attendance records. 76,229 fans fans attended their show at the Silver Dome in Pontiac, Michigan, the most ever for a single act show up to that point. However, the tour had some problems. On April 19th, police arrested 70 people as around 1,000 fans tried to storm the gates, throwing rocks and bottles to attempt to break into a sold-out show at the Riverfront Coliseum in Cincinnati, Ohio. During the show, a fan died after falling from the third floor of the Coliseum. On June 3rd, their Tampa Stadium show was cut short due to a severe thunderstorm, even though tickets said, quote, rain or shine. After this, some fans started a riot, and this led to several arrests and injuries. At the July 23rd show at Oakland Coliseum in Oakland, California, John Benden, the band's infamous bodyguard, known for his short temper, beat the crap out of members of the local security team. In a a second scuffle, Peter Grant and John Bonham got involved, and two days later, a SWAT team showed up and arrested them, along with Benden and tour manager Richard Cole. They were all charged with assault. After they were bailed out, the band flew to their next show in New Orleans, where Robert Plant learned that his five-year-old son had suddenly died from a stomach virus. They immediately canceled the rest of the tour and never played in the United States again after that. At the end of 1977, the future of the band seemed to be in jeopardy, and indeed, the public didn't hear much from them over the next year. By September 1978, though, the band was itching to get back to making music. When they did get together, they went crazy with the experimentation this time, especially Jones with his synthesizers. At the end of the year, they recorded some new songs at Polar Studios in Stockholm, Sweden. These songs were definitely much different than most earlier Led Zeppelin stuff. In particular, they were less heavy. You could say, more built for pop radio, actually. Although the band wasn't completely satisfied with the new stuff, they released what would become their eighth and final studio album, In Through the Outdoor, on August 15th, 1979. It was another commercial success, hitting the top of the music charts in several countries. It also featured two pretty big hits, Fool in the Rain and All My Love, which was a tribute to Plant's son who had died. While In Through the Outdoor also went on to sell millions, critics were generally more, uh, critical 
of it. Not only that, but many longtime Led Zeppelin fans were disillusioned by the new sound. 1979 also saw the band returning to the stage. They played a total of four shows in August. Big ones. They had 104,000 fans in the audience at the first show of the Nebworth Music Festival. Still, by this time, both Jimmy Page and John Bonham had struggled greatly with their addiction to drugs. Page was using too much heroin, and Bonham was drinking too much alcohol. In June 1980, the band once again toured Europe, playing some more low-key shows. The June 27th show in Nuremberg, Germany, came to a halt in the middle of the third song when Bonham passed out on stage and had to be rushed to the hospital. Many assumed excessive drug use was the cause. That would be the band's final tour. They had planned on returning for another tour in North America, but Bonham died died on September 25th, 1980, after consuming around 40 shots of vodka while rehearsing with the band at Jimmy Page's house. He had choked on his own vomit after passing out. Page, Plant, and Jones decided the band could not go on without Bonham. They issued a statement in December that said, quote, We wish it to be known that the loss of our dear friend and the deep sense of undivided harmony felt by ourselves and our manager have led us to decide that we could not continue as we were. It was over. Following the breakup of the band, the surviving members, who are all still alive, went on to have successful solo careers. Jones mostly went back to behind-the-scenes stuff, producing and arranging. Plant went on to record 11 solo albums over the years and has often collaborated with big names. Page also had some solo albums, but also formed a supergroup called The Firm with Paul Rogers from the band Bad Company. On November 19th, 1982, the band released Coda, a compilation album of unreleased tracks from their 12-year career. A lot of the songs on it had been bootlegged already anyway. Over the years, they released an additional 12 compilation albums. They also released three additional live albums. As far as reunions, eh, there have only been a few. The three surviving members played Live Aid in 1985, the Atlantic Records 40th Anniversary Concert in 1988, which was the first one that featured John Bond Bonham's son Jason on drums, but he wasn't done yet. They also reunited for their induction into the United States Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on January 12, 1995. Jason Bonham once again played drums for the occasion. On December 10th, 2007, Jason once again played drums with them as they reunited at the Amit Erdogan Tribute Concert in London. It was simply an incredible performance, and it will likely be the last time we ever see the three remaining members of the band perform again. Today, Led Zeppelin is one of the best-selling bands of all time. They've sold as many as 300 million records worldwide. And talk about freaking influence. So many of their contemporaries and bands that came after them kind of just ripped them off. Truly, few bands were as original as Led Zeppelin. Nearly every song they released was a surprise in a good way. Not only that, the four members of the band are all considered some of the greatest and most influential of all time at their respective instruments. Bonham is often ranked as one of the best drum Drummers ever. Jones is often ranked as one of the best bassists, keyboard players, and even music arrangers ever. Plant is often ranked as one of the best hard rock singers and songwriters ever. And of course, Jimmy Page is often ranked as one of the best guitarists of all time. Maybe the best ever. When I think of Led Zeppelin, the first word that comes to mind is innovation. They refused to follow. They only led, and most other bands were constantly trying to play catch up with them, especially in their early years. They were to the 1970s what the Beatles were to the 1960s. To put it bluntly, there was a BLZ and an ALZ before Led Zeppelin and after Led Zeppelin. They changed not only the music industry, but music forever.